thank you. I was sitting across the lunch table from a colleague when he asked me what I was going to do next. You see, it was 2013, and I was preparing to take my professional engineering licensing exams, the terminal certification for civil and environmental engineers. And he said to me, you basically have two options. You can either leverage your new license for a higher salary at your current company, stay, and continue doing the same kind of work, or you can leverage your license for a higher salary at a different company, move, and continue doing the same kind of work. I have to be honest that neither one of those options really made my heart beat faster. As far back as I could remember, this marked the beginning of my quarter life crisis. <laughs> Yeah. Oh dear. <laughs> now I know what some of you are thinking. How is it possible that any 20-something who still has all of their hair and this incredible waistline stressed out to the point of a life crisis? Well, please consider the rapid change and many life-defining decisions that we go through in our 20s. We graduate from college, we get our first job, we move to a new town, we get our first place, we find a significant other, and we gotta pay for that wedding, on top of the mortgage for our first house, then we have a dog, two kids on the way, all before we're 30. <laughs> it's no wonder that three decades ago, a person's per first experience with depression would normally happen in their late 40s to early 50s, what we would call the midlife crisis. But today, the average age of major depression onset is mid-20s. And all of the studies that I have read consistently claim that the majority of mid to late 20-somethings, in some cases 75% or more, have gone through what they would consider a life crisis. <coughs> Anecdotally, I know this to be true from conversations that I've had with my peers. Once I started opening up about what I was feeling, I realized that I was not alone in experiencing this. We 20-somethings are groomed to believe that there is a particular path to success. We continue down that path for so long, never raising our heads even once to see whether or not the destination towards which we are headed is really where we want to be going. And by the time we arrive, we realize, well, maybe it wasn't. Maybe we left our dreams and aspirations on the side of the road somewhere in favor of stability and our parents' approval. And maybe we're just getting a little bit too old to become the person that we really wanted to be. And maybe it's just a little bit too late and we're in too deep into this life that we've created for ourselves to make major change. And then, well, the medical term for it is we freak out. <laughs> I should know. My own quarter life crisis was marked by incredibly physical and visceral reactions like high levels of anxiety and panic attacks. But it was also marked by a lot of quiet retrospection. I began to ask myself a lot of questions that I know the people in this room have asked of themselves as well. Like, how did I even end up here? Is this really all there is? Am I doomed to sit in this cubicle for the next 50 years until I either retire or die? I mean, is this career, my life's work, really helping me to achieve my life's purpose? Is it? These questions are big, abstract, existential even, and I could not wrap my head around them, let alone answer them concretely. And even if I could, honestly, I'm not sure I would have known what steps to take next. You see, these big questions aren't actionable. In fact, they're the opposite. They're paralyzing because, God forbid, if we should answer them incorrectly and take the wrong steps forward, we might find ourselves back in the same spot a couple years from now, having yet another life crisis. Well, eventually, your life crisis is going to come to a head. You've got to do something about it. And for most of us, that's going to be a pretty superficial action. We'll put a patch on our problem. We'll make a change which really changes nothing. You know the stereotypes that I'm talking about here. You buy a Ferrari because it makes you feel young and desirable. Or you get a divorce because obviously it's your significant other's fault for trapping you in this position. Or you cut off all of your hair and dye it a funky color to prove that you're still rebellious and different from everyone else around you. Well, in 2013, I could not afford a fancy sports car. I am not married. And I happen to be very partial to this natural brunette hair color of mine, so a dye job was not an option. No, I had to find a different patch for my problem. My patch was to start a business, to become an entrepreneur. Yeah, in retrospect, I think the Ferrari would have honestly been way more fun and maybe cheaper, <laughs> but 
hindsight is 2020. Now, I decided to become an entrepreneur, but please have no delusions about this. I want to be very clear. I did not become an entrepreneur and start a business because I thought it was going to help me work through my life crisis or give me a way to solve any of my problems. No. I started a business because I was looking for an excuse. An excuse to quit my job, an excuse to move to a new town, an excuse to feel bold. I didn't become an entrepreneur and start a business because it was my purpose or my goal. I became an entrepreneur because I was looking for a way to get back my freedom and autonomy in life. I was sick of asking my boss for permission to go to the dentist. And if I'm being completely honest, I just wanted to get the heck out of Dodge. But the funny thing, though, is that entrepreneurship became way more than, than just a patch for my problem. It actually was a journey of personal self-discovery, which ultimately helped me to end my quarter-life crisis. And here is exactly how. Through the course of starting my own business, I was forced to ask myself a lot of questions about how I wanted to run that business. Anything from where I wanted to host my website online to what colors I wanted to represent my brand. Purple, by the way. <laughs> I was making concrete decisions every day and moving my business forward. Well, naturally, some of those questions dealt with the integration of my business operations and my personal life. So a perfect example would be, where is the best place for me to establish my business, and is that really where I want to live? It is through these actionable questions that entrepreneurship gave me the practical context for working through some of my larger, more abstract issues in small, meaningful steps that ultimately allowed me to end my quarter-life crisis. Now, while it is my hope that every single person in this room would go home and start a business of your own so that you might understand what it is I'm trying to convey here today, I recognize that not everyone here has aspirations to become the next Fortune 500 CEO. But that is okay, because what I have done is I have identified six of the most important actionable questions that I was forced to ask myself in the course of starting my business, which ultimately helped me get to a better state of mind. It is my sincere hope that these questions will act as a tool so that if any of you are going through your own life crisis, when you're at home, alone, sitting on your bed, asking one of those big abstract questions like, what am I doing with my life? You will put that out of your mind, and instead, you will turn to these questions, and you will ask them, and you will find those small, meaningful steps that you need to take in your own life to get to a better state. So, without further ado, our very first actionable question is all about enthusiasm. What, it is, what is it that you get incredibly, unapologetically excited about? What would you spend all of your time doing for no other reason that it makes you really happy? During a life crisis, we are confronted with the harsh truth that our day-to-day -day lives have become pretty boring, pretty monotonous, and we no longer dedicate any time to those activities which really bring us true joy. Well, one of the cool things that I think about entrepreneurship is you can pretty much start a business about almost anything. And if you want your business to succeed, it should definitely be something that you're really excited about. So for me, some of those things are teaching, speaking, writing, coaching. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. Running my own business is a lot of work. But it's also more fun than any other job that I have ever had, because every single day I get to do some of those activities that I really find joy in. So if you're going through a life crisis, I ask you to think about some of those activities that you really find joy in, and to find ways to incorporate them into your everyday life, not just on special occasions. Our next actionable question is all about knowledge. What do you need to learn? You know, during a life crisis, our mind spends a lot of time thinking about negative thoughts, and it's really hard to get that worry out of our heads. But I don't know about you, whenever I'm learning something new, diving in and trying to obtain a new skill, especially if it's something that I'm excited about, hearkening back to question number one, then I find I'm no longer spending time on those negative thoughts, but rather I'm reading books, and I'm also watching tutorial videos on YouTube. When you're an entrepreneur, there are a lot of new things that you need to learn. And at the beginning of my entrepreneurial journey, you could have found me up at all hours of the night figuring out how to self-publish my own book and reading blogs about sales tax. 
Now, those were not nights spent lying in my bed, tossing and turning, and going to a very dark place. There are things in life that we all should know by now, we need to know, or we want to know. So whether it's a new language, a new instrument, learning how to code, or something else entirely, dedicate yourself to learning something new during your life crisis. Our third question is all about community. Who do you really want to spend your time around? During a life crisis, it is incredibly important to surround yourself with people who understand what you're going through, who will support you, and whose company you genuinely enjoy. But I think that if we're being honest with ourselves, that's not always our nine to five coworkers. Entrepreneurship provides you with an opportunity to actually curate a community of people in your life that you want to have in your life versus just having to have people in your life because you happen to work at the same company. When I was working my nine to five, I was surrounded by a bunch of brilliant engineers, but they were all men and they were all about 30 years older than me. <laughs> I really wanted to have more women, more 20 somethings, more creative type of people in my life. And entrepreneurship gave me a great path to being able to find them through my partners, my vendors, my clients, and even my competitors. So I implore you, if you're in the middle of a life crisis, then take a judicious look at who is in your community. Whose company do you really desire that you don't have, that you really want? Go out, find them, and make them a part of your community. Our next question is all about empowerment. What are some short-term goals that you can accomplish today that will help you build back up that self-confidence in yourself that you have lost, that you are going to need in the future? Inadequate, not good enough. Those are some of the feelings that we have whenever we're in the middle of a life crisis. And as an entrepreneur, I have felt them too, thinking that I didn't even deserve to be in business, like I should just quit. But I will never forget the day that I made my first sale to a total stranger. Somebody that I didn't know bought a book that I wrote, and I am convinced that they read it. <laughs> but I harnessed the empowered feeling that I had, and I made a new goal to sell 10 books, and I achieved it. So I made a new goal to sell 100, and I achieved that, and the pattern goes on. During a life crisis, it is incredibly easy for us to get obsessed with those long-term goals that we're supposed to have, that 10-year plan. But I know that there are short-term goals in your life that you could be tackling right now that will help build back up that self-confidence you lost somewhere along the way. So whether it's running your first half marathon or singing that solo in church on Sunday, figure out one of those short-term goals that you can tackle that you can conquer, you can look at and say, I did that. Harness that empowerment and then leverage it for your future opportunities. Speaking of future opportunities, what groundwork can you lay today that will help you get those future opportunities when they come around? Now, trapped is a word that I often hear people say when they're in the middle of a life crisis. They feel like they can't get out of their current circumstance and go after what they really want because there are things that are holding them back. Maybe they, they want to take a new job, which is ultimately going to pay less, but they can't because they have a mortgage to worry about. Or maybe they want to move to a new city, but they have a family they need to consider now. Being an entrepreneur teaches us that we need to be prepared for any moment that our next big break is right around the corner. And so maybe if you do want to move in the future to be more mobile, you need to start downsizing your possessions. Or maybe if you want to get a new job, you need to acquire a new skill or put in place a new revenue stream. What is some of the groundwork that you can lay in your own life to help you leverage those future opportunities when they come around? And lastly, legacy. In the middle of a life crisis, it's pretty easy to stay focused on me, it, on yourself. It's pretty easy to say, well, my life, my predicament, my future. But what we end up doing is creating a bubble of self-pity around ourselves that's pretty difficult to break through. But we don't live in a bubble. We live on a planet with seven billion other people. And I can pretty much guarantee you that almost everyone has a life that is harder than yours. 
Now, I don't say that in any way to belittle or negate the feelings that you go through during a life crisis. But I will be the very first to admit that during a life crisis, we tend to get a little bit self-centered. And the thing that I have noticed about self-centered individuals is that they do not leave very charitable legacies. Entrepreneurship is all about taking the focus off of ourselves and putting it on others. At its core, entrepreneurship is all about service because we have to walk in somebody else's shoes and understand their problems if we have any hope of creating a product that can alleviate their pains. Now, just like an individual has a legacy, companies have legacies too. They're called brands. I think that each one of us can think of a couple brands in our head which ultimately have positive br uh, legacies based on customer service and also good works. But I think that we can all name a couple of brands that we look ill upon because of their single focus on profit making. Whenever I started my business from the very beginning, I said to myself that I wanted to create a brand known for customer service and the positive impact that I was going to have on other people's lives. And I want the exact same thing for my legacy in life. And the only way I know to achieve that in both cases is through service. So in the middle of your life crisis, when you find yourself saying, me, myself, and I, just a little bit too much, then I hope that you will think about your legacy and go out and serve the world. Now, in the middle of my life crisis, I was absolutely convinced that it would never, ever end. And I certainly wouldn't want to ever go back and live through it again. Which is why I know that people listening to me today who are going through their own life crises are going to think I'm crazy when I say that, now that it's all said and done, I'm actually really glad that it happened. And I'm not the only one who thinks that. According to one study, 80% of respondents who had been through a life crisis actually said that they looked upon the experience with favor. Because ultimately, it helped them, helped us, carve our own paths to success. Our life crises were catalysts for change. But we know that change doesn't come without action. So I hope today our exploration of these actionable questions will aid you to make progress out of your own life crises. And well, if it doesn't, I'm sure Ferrari would love to have your business. <laughs> Thank you.